Hello and welcome to another Build a Soil FAQ video. Today we've got season six FAQ number six. And so like usual, uh, Dean who does all the video editing, thanks Dean, he goes through the YouTube videos and he selects a whole bunch of questions that seem pertinent. I can do a better job describing it on camera to the best of my ability and then everybody can benefit from your questions. So thank you for asking them. Dean, thank you for picking them. Let's jump right in. Okay, first question. Markin8888 says, are terps highest on milky trikes or will it develop more when amber trikes appear? You know, I don't know the answer to this one, but as far as milky trikes and amber, to me, that's more about the active cannabinoids, not the terpenes. The terpenes are gonna be most expressed, I think, when you smell it the loudest on the plant. And that's gonna be in that proper window. And obviously they change from the beginning to the end. Depending on the genetic, you may like the odor different at certain points. And I think they may be independent of that finish time for the finishing of the actual cannabinoids. It does make sense though. A lot of guys that are making hash, they're going after you know those that really tasty terpiness. And a lot of times they're not going quite as far. So maybe it's slightly more present up front. But a lot of that is preserved through proper drying because the terpenes are volatile. So a terpene, a terpenoid, Coop taught me back in the day, hey, those are just carbon, oxygen, or carbon and hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. And so those compounds could be volatile, especially the ones with oxygen. And when you're drying, if they volatilize off, you can lose some of your odor there. That's why for hash makers, fresh frozen represents a more close taste odor translation from the living plant to the finished product. But then there's different forms of curing as far as like old school hash and the different odors that you get from a finished product that's, that's much more aged. And so to me, I don't know the answer, but there's signs. And so I would pay attention to that. Next question, Beanie, what's up? I need some coffee here. Okay, Beanie says, what's up? Could you please try answering this? We'll see. I've bought and vegged a pack of feminized seeds from a reputable breeder, uh, Barney's Farm run few of the same pack, runs muffin. Now flowering on the same schedule as the BAS YouTube 10 by 10. One is a male, 100%, no Hermy, straight up male. Never heard of a full male from a fem pack. Would this pollen be viable and also regular? I'd like to use the pollen on chucking a regular female mum I like. Don't wanna risk the girls if he's a dud. All right, so first off, it's normal. And I'm not gonna say that you should experience this in a high percentage, but if you buy 100 seeds that are feminized, in theory, one of them should be a full-blown male. And this is just, you know, nature finds a way, right? But it's 99 something percent. Same when you're doing DNA sex testing, it's not 100%. So there's always that outlier, especially if you really know that it's, that it's full-on male. Now, as far as the DNA, the way that it was produced to make the feminized seeds and being self like that, I don't think it's gonna have both sets of chromosomes, and so I'm not sure if it's gonna be totally viable pollen. It may be, right? I'm inexperienced in this, and so I would just, quick Google would probably tell you if, if self, like S1 seeds found male would actually have viable pollen or not, or whether that's a problem. But look it up before you go chucking it. I'd imagine a lot more experienced people that watch this show, in particular to like actual breeding, they can answer that question. Hopefully they'll chime in here. But I like to say, I don't know when I don't know. Spano says, how do I prevent iron bacteria in my reservoir tank? I use a water filter, but sometimes when I use my res water for feeding or humidifier, it smells like rusty water. Do I need to introduce oxygen to my res? New to Discord, appreciate the help. Spano, you know, I'm getting a whole bunch in a row that I don't know the answer to, but this is good. Uh, what I mean is, I don't know about iron bacteria, and it could be just what you're calling it because you smell something like musty in the water. Um, it could be your particular water source. If you're using a water filter and you're filling it to your res, Usually that's good enough. A lot of people do like to add oxygen to it because that motion, that bubbling, it keeps it in motion, more like natural water. And the oxygen should keep it cleaner. I typically don't have to do that. So unless you're actually seeing like rust in the tank and maybe you're using like a float valve that has that, that like brass material and that could be lending itself to it. But if it's just like rusty water, I'm not sure what that means. But adding oxygen is, is something that you can do. Just be sure that when you do that, you clean the air stone or you don't use an air stone and you clean whatever you're using occasionally because now you're introducing something that is like another step as far as cleaning. And that's part of why I don't do it, but um, I think it does make a difference. Otherwise, you could get a water test. You could check your water filter, a couple things that you might wanna see there. Um, other things could be like algae, if light's getting in, things like that. So, okay, next question, bear. Is it better to have higher temps and lower humidity or lower temps with slightly 
higher humidity and late flower. Currently week seven of flower, it's extremely humid in my area, 91% humidity outside today. So the only way I keep the humidity down is with a dehumidifier, which raises the temps. Huh, air conditioning can be a dehumidifier, probably not a, as effective though. I can average temps in the low 80s with 50% humidity or temps in the mid to low 70s with humidity in the 60s. Man, I think I would go close. So weakest link is basically what you're asking. And I think humidity is the weaker link when it comes to what could ruin a grow because bud rot's gonna be worse than not. And to me, that's just my answer. So 50% would be better targeted, plus 80 degrees is not too hot. Obviously finishing flower, it sucks to be warmer at the end, but with these newer grow lights, I'd imagine if your grow room's 80, if you took leaf surface temperature, you're probably in the mid 70s. And I think that you're totally safe there. And that 50% humidity just sounds a lot better to me. I'm experiencing something in the last 10 by 10 video I didn't mention, I forgot. But it's such a big canopy, it's overgrown. One of the challenges with that is now it's harder to control the humidity, even though it's dry out here. It's in a transitional state, so it's not super dry yet for Colorado. And then there'll be some rain outside. This week looks better. We're getting closer to finishing, so I hope it holds, but I've been opening my tent up, opening the warehouse up, getting a lot more air movement. That drops my humidity down in the 40s, and that's good for me. So for you, I would do what it takes to keep the humidity low and then worry about temps as the second weakest link. That was a good question. Okay, next one, black coat. Do ferments like the FPJ and FPE JLF contain fulvic acids? I see a lot of growers using full power from BioAg or similar products. I've thought about trying it out because I like to experiment and tinker. However, thanks to BAS, I heavily learned, uh, leaned into making and using my own ferments. And I wondered if there would be any point. I don't wanna waste money on a brand if I essentially have a homemade version of the same thing. Man, this is going a little deeper. It could be a long conversation. I don't believe there's fulvic acids in FPJ, FPA, and JLF, depending on what you're fermenting. And so I know um, Organics Alive has some humics and fulvics within there, some of their ferments. And so it could be that I'm overlooking something. But when you're looking at a pure fulvic acid or a humic acid extract, you're usually looking at something that is like saying, is there, wheat, is there are there trichomes on, this, on my stalks of my plants that's waste versus hash? And so there may be in your ferments a small amount of fulvic and humic, but comparatively, I think something like a high lignin hardwood compost would have a lot more humic fulvic fraction, even though it's just compost. And then looking at the pure extract, like the Wujin sand, the, the full power from Dr. Faust, from BioAg, I think it's gonna be a lot more potent. Now, here's the thing, it all works. And so while I really do believe in Dr. Faust, the company has changed hands and I don't believe Dr. Faust owns it anymore. And while I learned a lot from him, one of the things that I remember is that in hydroponics, that presence of the fulvic acid made a significant difference because now they could use less nutrients. However, in a living soil with copious amounts of compost, enzymatic action, biology, root-wise, enzymes, all of that together creates access to some of the same beneficial properties of humic and fulvic, and there should be some in there. So supplementing may not be such a game changer. Um, there's tools, and we mentioned this in the last 10 by 10. We're doing water only. For episode 22, I was mentioning how it's better to feed when you've overgrown the container size than it is to just go pure water only based on what your goals are. And same thing when it comes to like fulvic, meaning if you're trying to wake up some old seeds, a pure fulvic might be a really much better way to go than trying to just do a ferment. But and ferments are good too. And we've now learned that these seeds actually breathe and there are endopathogenic bacteria that are part of that entire process. So we're getting into an area where I think the more I learn, the less I know. And so I'm hesitant to say, yes, your ferments have fulvic and you don't need anything else. But I also know you don't need any of these products to grow. So it's kind of like, you should experiment. You should definitely try it. Don't overdo it, but it's a really potent tool. And I think everybody should play with it. So hash hyped. I have a question about the earth boxes. After growing such a big plant in the box, what do you do with the soil afterwards? Is it 100% depleted of nutrients or close to? Also, after building up the top layer with so much build a flower, I found the next round of veg plants kind of showed deficiencies. I was wondering if it's because there's just not enough material for vegetative growth left in the box. Yes and no, a lot of times it creates a layer that is not the balanced level of substrate and drainage and pumice and everything that we're used to in the regular layer. So what I do with an earth box when I'm done, and I've tested this, part of why the earth box is so cool is it teaches us that you don't have to be a chemistry expert as far as water soluble nutrients go. Because when you start with an earth box, you can literally grow in pro mix and put only your nutrients and minerals on top in literally different parts of the earth box and it'll figure it out and the plant will grow. So when you get to your second round, it may not be as balanced of a soil, but you can always top dress. 
To start that though, it's more about the volume of the container and some of the limiting factors. So if you've mounded it pretty good with Build-A-Flower, I like to scrape all of that off, throw it into my worm bin or use it elsewhere in the garden. Start with something that has a little bit, le you know, like it's not mounded anymore when I transplant. That way I get rid of that heavy top dressing from the last round. And then I can start with a fresh top dressing and go from there. It works. Um, the earth box, as far as no-till, round, around, 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 it can be a little bit more finicky than doing a large container of soil, partially because we are overgrowing for a seven gallon container, which is part of the territory with the earth box, but I've done it successfully. It really does work. And so I encourage you to experiment and then you can always just dump it out, re-amend and start fresh with some fresh you know, pumice, add it back in and, and put it back up and see how it goes. See the difference for yourself and see if it's really worth it. So good questions. Man, it's been the smoke right before. Okay, next question. Corbett says, would you say the Trader Grow is about the same as the Earth Box? If not, what's the difference? Very similar. So Earth Box is smaller, it's more mobile, it's good for patio gardens, it's good for many different purposes. I trust it, it's food grade plastic, but it's one, it's one problem is, it's a little too small to be my ideal container. And so introducing the Trader Grow has been like my dream come true. It acts very much like an Earth Box. The difference is, is we're not manually watering it and then letting a dry cycle occur. In the earth box, the reservoir sits below and the soil sits perched up on a plastic tray. And so if this was the plastic tray, the water when you first fill it is here. Immediately after drinking and wicking, the water goes down and there's an air gap. I think that air gap is part of the power of the earth box that you can't get in any other way on the tray to grow. However, the tray to grow, one of the things I've been playing with, instead of leaving it fully on, which is like keeping your earth box full. I've been playing with turning the reservoir off, turning it on, and we're coming up with an intelligent automated way to do that through our EcoWit sensor. We'll be sharing it soon, but I've got to test it first. You don't have to do that, but that air gap, turning on and off the tray to grow, I think that it's gonna give you similar experiences. Certainly mine has been just as good as the earth box, but it's got more horsepower. It would be easier to no-till because you won't overgrow it so easily. So to me, the tray to grow is, is really like the next level. But the earth box is such a fundamentally universal tool that we're always going to carry both. One doesn't necessarily replace the other, but Trader Grow is like a big boy version of the earth box for sure. So thank you for asking that. Casey, do you have a favorite ferment to use during flower? Pumpkin versus peach versus banana or what? They all work. So what I have on hand is typically what I go to. I'd be lying if I told you one was a favorite. Because they all have a little bit of a funky odor, I tend to grab the ones that I like the smell of better, but I think pumpkin peach are probably my go-to. I just grab one or the other. I usually have one, one on the shelf. And so, to be honest, I have no preference. I like using both of those. Kimbo Slice, Jeremy, much love and respect for everything you do. I don't know where I'd be without your videos and all the knowledge. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, my question is, what's your thoughts on Grove Bags? Thanks again. Um, I don't use grow bags. It could be that I'm missing out on something, but I prefer glass. I also have for long-term storage, big bags that I think are good. And you could probably use a grow bag to do that. The big bags that we carry are just extra thick freezer bags that are good for like using a heat sealer and vacuum sealing on. And if I'm not gonna vacuum seal, like I can take a little bit of the air out in the vacuum sealer, stop it and then seal it. That way I'm not smashing them. But I like using those because I can use them for my meat. I buy like grass fed local beef. And then I can put all of the containers that it comes in in this really thick bag and then I can vacuum seal it, put it in the freezer. Then I can take another bag out and I can use it for my cannabis where the Grove bags are a little bit more individual and the price represents that. But the other thing that they, they claim to have is the Terp Lock, which the bags that we use, they have one of the lowest rates of reintroduction of oxygen back into the bag, which is what does the degradation. And so they use multiple layers of film to do that. I think the Grove Bags Turp Lock is using something similar with multiple layers, but they're targeting an optimum humidity. What I find to be a challenge with that is people start to trust these humidity devices and they put cannabis in there that may be over wet or too dry and expecting these technologies to fix it for them. I think it's better to just do old school, get it right, use the humidity, use your intuition, and then put it down in long-term storage. Glass is my absolute favorite. And if you have to go to bulk, you know, uh, plastic, I like those big bags. Here's the thing, I've heard people love the Grove bags. So although I'm just talking, saying, you know, generalities about plastic, like if you like it and that's what works for you, do it, right? If that's what makes you happy. Um, I think it's different than adding those, like those uh, moisture packs. I don't like those. So for what it's worth, glass is my favorite. 
but I, I wouldn't hesitate to use a grow bag if I had one. It's just not my, my thing. So Stony Farms says, Jeremy, I have a question. As in living soil, everyone says not to pH the water. Okay, I understand that. But what about seedling in the first few weeks of life in a one gallon? Is it still considered living soil or do I pH due to the drybacks not wanting to over water? Thank you. Much love and respect out of Memphis, Tennessee. Stony Farms, this is a really good question. I'm glad you're answering, um, asking it because I want to answer it for a lot of people. Let me take a drink. So as far as pH goes, it's not as simple as people explain. The reason why pH is not really important is the pH of the soil recipe is it's contributed to by the level of calcium and magnesium and sodium and potassium and all the different cations and anions and everything that makes up this soil. And so when that soil consists of all these things that are built up to create a pretty stable pH, the idea of taking a neutral water that's clean with nothing in it, very low part per million, clean water, neutral pH, and adjusting it for some reason doesn't make sense because it's not going to do anything as the soil really is the buffer, and that's where the pH is derived from. The other thing is that the rhizosphere, when it's biologically active and those roots are in there, they can adjust the pH pretty significantly right around that root zone in the rhizosphere, and, and it can do it on its own to adjust what it's uptaking. And so we don't wanna steer that too much. However, when it comes to a one gallon, is this still happening? Um, yes, in the sense that if you've got clean water and you've got a good mix of soil, you don't need a pH. And so, Maybe what I would say is pH once, like when you move to a new house or when you know what your water source is, let's get a water test. Let's look at, let's look at the pH. Let's look at the total dissolved solids or what might be in there. And if it's got a high level of solubility, like um, soluble salts, or if the pH is really out of whack, it may be no big deal. It may be something that's a problem. So then you can get a water test. And once you find out that either before the filter or after the filter, it's not a big deal, or depending on the, what the lab says, you know that it's, that it's good water. Well, now you don't need a pH. You don't need to adjust it every time because we're not like adding nutrients and then having to stabilize it and then waiting for uptake there. The soil is gonna do all of it. So that's my answer as far as pH. When it comes to well water, agricultural water, a lot of times there's bicarbonate in that water that using an acid actually neutralizes and does make sense to pH. So for most indoor growers using clean filtered water, there's really not a point. And I hope that makes sense to you. If you've got more questions like this that you'd like me to answer on camera for everyone else to learn from, post them up in here, post them up on our YouTube videos. And because we're often age restricted, it really helps if you hit the subscribe button, it helps the algorithm, and it gives us a larger audience to share with as most of the time we're shadow banned. So thanks so much for participating. If you like this stuff, you can also check out our Instagram. Our website is buildasoil.com. And until next time, I will see you on the next Build a Soil FAQ video.